Hello and welcome to the BCBS Early Career Session, Next Best Thing in Cardiovascular Research. My name is Dominic Del Rey. I'm at Rutgers University and I was a co-moderator for the Early Career Session 1. And what we're going to do today, along with my other co-moderators of these sessions, is try to give you the highlights and takeaways of what we learned today. So in session one, um, we heard a really elegant study um, given by Mason Wheeler and colleagues from the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute at Virginia Tech. And what they did was identified a novel role, role for the protein known as uh, red REDD1 in its regulation of insulin sensitivity uh, in cardiomyocytes. And the authors really um, took great pains to investigate the mechanism by which this um, happens and actually identified uh, two separate mechanisms, one uh, that takes place in the cytosol, the other in the nucleus. Um, the one in the cytosol um, leads to inhibited mTORC1 signaling, while one in the nucleus actually directly impacts uh, chromatin dynamics and regulating gene expression thereby leading to increased expression of uh, many different metabolic related genes, um, as well as down regulation of other genes such as autophagy related genes. And one thing that I really liked about this study was its potential impact because um, we know that diabetes and diabetic cardiomyopathy are really major problems um, in the population. And if we can better understand mechanisms that regulate um, insulin sensitivity as well as insulin signaling, um, this could be really important to advance, advance the, um, the field and add significantly um, to our understanding of this field. So now I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Kedrin Baskin, who is my co-moderator for session one. I'm Dr. Kedrin Baskin from The Ohio State University, and I was also co-monitoring the session on the uh, next best thing in cardiovascular research. And I wanna highlight a couple of findings that we heard about this morning. Um, the first was by Dr. Alvarez Arce and uh, colleagues, where they uh, identified a new protein that is uh, specifically expressed in atrial myocytes and found a role whereby it regulates um, contractility. They identified this new protein similar to myosin binding protein C, and it's called MYBPHL. It's specifically expressed in atrial, um, fiber, uh, atrial cardiomyocytes. And there's um, speculation as to whether it um, interacts with uh, sarcomeric proteins and perhaps plays a similar role uh, like myosin binding protein C in cardiomyocytes to um, control contractility. And so this study really highlights the importance of understanding biofilament proteins and their localization and um, function, and potentially has identified a new protein that could be playing a role in um, cardiac disease, which we know little about. And the exciting thing about this study is perhaps this protein MYBPHL may function similarly to myosin binding protein C, and hence open up new lines of investigation and potentially therapeutics, um, given the fact that some heart failure patients do have mutations in this protein. The second study I'd like to highlight it, uh, was presented by Dr. Gan uh, and colleagues from UT Southwestern, who identified a new RNA binding protein called RBPMS, that mediates cardiomyocyte binucleation and cardiovascular development. So this study really highlighted the importance of our understanding of cardiac development and the changes that occur during embryonic development and postnatal development and identified a new um, function for RNA binding proteins and splicing and potentially highlights a role of how splicing proteins can control binucleation and potentially um, cardiomyocyte number during embryonic development and postnatal development. And so this really opens up the field for RNA binding proteins that have been highlighted in the past, but potentially leads to um, new avenues of understanding the roles of these RNA binding proteins and their downstream effects. 
And so with that, I would like to turn over the discussion to the moderators of the second session of the next best thing in cardiovascular research. Thank you, Dr. Baskin. So uh, I'm Dr. Mo Alcala from the Ottawa Heart Institute, and uh, I was uh, co-moderating the second session of the early career next best thing in cardiovascular research. And I'll quickly highlight two of the talks that were uh, that were really fascinating and discussed uh, during this session. Um, first was the uh, uh, the talk by uh, Dr. Fong Tai from UC Davis. Uh, titled Mitochondrial Microdomain Disruption Results in Sinus Node Dysfunction in Heart Failure. So uh, what they, what the group has done is uh, look and investigate some um, new aspects of um, the mitochondrial dysfunction that results in uh, heart failure disease using um, animal, model, uh, animal model of uh, pressure overload called uh, TAC where they also uh, uh, indicated and, and uh, studied the uh, irregular heartbeats that could result in, uh, in this, in this uh, disease model. Uh, this, this particular um, rhythm dysfunction is called radi arrhythmia. And uh, what was really interesting is that they, they were able to like uh, focus on the uh, special types of cells called the sand cells and they saw that there was an actual reduced potential action potential uh, frequency, um, basically an impaired calcium release within the cells. Um, this induced uh, morphological changes to specifically the organelle called the mitochondria. And uh, using advanced microscopy and molecular techniques, they were able to uh, further uh, delineate uh, what kind of changes occurred in the mitochondria. Specifically, they found that uh, the heart failure had more condensed mitochondria in terms of structure, as well as more branched uh, mitochondria, both which are um, definitely outside of the normal orthodox uh, structure and function of, of this organelle. And uh, the study uncovered a specific protein named uh, MFN2 as being a key regulator of this mitochondrial structural change that occurs in heart failure. And uh, I'll quickly uh, jump and highlight another talk uh, in this session. Uh, this one was uh, given by uh, Dr. Prachi Ambarkar, and uh, this was from uh, University of uh, Alabama at Birmingham. And the focus of this was looking at a new function for a uh, for a gene known as GSK3 alpha. And uh, basically, the the classical knowledge of uh, GSK3 is that it, it, it is a part of the glycogen synthesis pathway. Uh, but uh, this group uh, has um, further investigated and uncovered uh, that GSK3 and specifically GSK3 alpha uh, has, a, has a role beyond the regulation of glycogen synthesis. Uh, they've, looked, uh, they've looked specifically at the effects of uh, this protein in the fibroblast, the, the um, scar forming cells within, within the heart. And using both pressure overload as well as uh, myocardial infarctions, uh, they were able to show that uh, deleting GSK3 alpha yielded less fibrosis or less scarring, uh, and therefore uh, imbued a, a type of cardioprotection. Uh, their molecular studies uh, showed that uh, GSK3 alpha works to promote fibrosis independent of a classical pathway known in, in fibrosis, which is the TGF, TGF beta SMAD3. So therefore, the study uncovered a new pathway, a new molecular pathway in regulating uh, fibrosis in a heart disease model. Uh, and I'll just mention that this, uh, this new pathway uh, goes through the RAF, MEK, ERK uh, specific pathway. And uh, that's an exciting new way of, uh, for, for future um, discussions and future investigations about fibrosis. And, with that, I'll uh, I'll hand over the the baton over to my co-moderator in the session for the last talk. Today. 
I'm Patricia Wynn. I was also from Stanford University. I was a co-moderator for the second session of The Next Best Thing. Um, I want to highlight a study presented by Lauren Sen Martin from the Center of Cardiovascular Investigation in Madrid, Spain. She presented a unique mouse model of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the most common genetic heart, genetic heart disease. Um, the mouse model she created was a mouse mutation, a missense mutation in the cardiomycin binding protein C, which modulates actin myosin contraction and regulates muscle spread and strength in the heart. Unlike other mouse models, um, which produce a truncated cardiomycin binding protein, um, which are, is, a, is a well characterized mutation, this R502W mutation. Um, is a missense mutation. And it she did demonstrate that it showed the phenotypic characterization of hokum using um, echo as well as MRI, um, showing reduced systolic and diastolic function. She also showed that there were transcriptional changes involved in the genes after the mutation was created um, that showed fibrosis and hypertrophy in the heart tissue cells. Um, she wanted to find a mechanism for the for this new mutation in terms of how it is creating the Hokum phenotype. Um, however, they were not able to find the mechanism, but they did show that certain mechanisms were not in play, including there was no alteration in the protein levels, there's proper localization within the sarcomere, and no alteration alteration in the myosin conformation states. And they, they also had similar decay times. While it seems more work needs to be done in this, it does show that single missense mutations can result in a Hokum phenotype, and we look forward to a, more work from this group. Thank you for joining us in this review of the early career session at BCBS, the next best thing in cardiovascular science. This fascinating work from our early career investigators and colleagues will lead to future translational projects to bring novel therapies to the bedside.